Shalom TV's coverage of the 2014 APAC Policy Conference is made possible in part by Naomi Vilko, MD, in memory of her father, William Vilko, and in memory of her other relatives who perished in the Shoah. What a pleasure I have right now to stand with Robert Satloff, who's with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. By the way, I've seen you many times. You were superb today. Thank you very uh, much. You, I don't know. You get better and better. So that's number one. That's number one. Uh, I want you to speak very quickly. I know you're on the run about three major issues that you spoke about here. Number one, first of all, Iran. Do you feel that at the moment, the American administration is moving in the right direction. I understood all the cautionary things you were telling this audience, but you get an audience here of people who are scared to death that in some way the Obama administration has made a mistake vis-a-vis -vis Iran and that we are permitting them to get closer and closer to having nuclear capability. What do you want to say to this room and the audience on Shalom TV? How scared is Robert Satloff? that Iran is moving in the wrong direction for us and is getting closer to that nuclear weapon. Well, there's no doubt that Iran is still getting closer to a nuclear weapon. Um, they're moving more slowly because of the terms of the interim agreement that we have, but they're still moving toward that direction. I think the, 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 the real question is, um, is our plan to, um, to definitively prevent and deny Iran the ability to make a nuclear we weapon? or? and this is really, I think, what the direction we're heading in, is our plan merely to give us what we think is adequate time. That was a brilliant analysis, by the way. Thank you. Um, that, is it to give us adequate time to detect Iran's cheating? That's really what these negotiations are about. And I'm asking you, does that satisfy you, Robert? Is that good well, enough it, for it, you? Look, for, for Rob Satloff, <laughs> Um, it, this is not the way I would have held the negotiations, but I'm not the negotiator. And, and I don't know everything that the people in the administration uh, know. I don't see all the documents. I can only imagine that a Martian looking at these negotiations would wonder why we are negotiating about how long we're going to give ourselves to figure out that the other guy is cheating, yes. rather than to deny the other guy the ability to cheat. All right, in another room, Dennis Ross basically said, that the, the Obama administration is now perceived in Israel and throughout the Middle East as somehow waffling over that red line that he drew in Syria, and that as a result, Israel and the Middle East allies of the United States do not trust the American administration today as they once did. From your perspective, how accurate is that? Do you agree or do you disagree with that analysis? Well, I, I don't know exactly what my colleague Dennis said, True. but I, 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 I do think that there is a common perception um, in many Arab capitals and in the many um, high offices in Israel that, uh, that the United States is um, uh, unwilling to uh, roll up its sleeves to get involved in Middle East um, crises in a way that would um, not just protect American interest, which we might be doing, but look out for our partners' interests, that instead um, we want to diminish our exposure to, um, to bad things in this region that, um, that we need to prioritize um, and we can't do everything and so therefore we're going to limit our exposure um, uh, and focus on what the administration determines are its, right, are its priorities. You make this distinction all the time and it's very important. There's a difference between perception and reality. One of the things I wanted to know from you, is it a fair description of the American administration to say that the president somehow failed on that red line reference? In fact, did the United States and did the Obama administration make a terrible error? Or is, or in the world of diplomacy and the world of international relations, was he simply talking the way any president would talk? To what extent does Robert Satloff really believe that the United States made a substantive error on the red line issue? 
Well, there's, there's multiple errors that one can be talking about here. Um, some focus on the error of enunciating a red line, that it's a mistake to enunciate red lines because um, what, it, what it does is it gives your opponent, your adversary, the right to go just up to the red line, do everything that is really nasty and mean, but just not cross that red line. And so red lines themselves are something that one should be extremely cautious about. Mm -hmm. When one does draw red lines, then kicks in the other critique, which is the absolute 110% responsibility to implement. Now, if you are a small country, if you are a Belgium, or you are, you know, uh, the Philippines or whatever, you can bend circumstances, etc. But when you are the indispensable nation, the nation to which other countries turn as a source of deterrence and confidence, then you should not be the party that fails to enforce your red lines. Okay. You were passionate about urging... Apologies to the Belgians and <laughs> no, the Filipinos. Okay. You were passionate about America taking a strong stand in Syria and doing things... I, I, you'll tell me if I get it right. Basically, you were asking for American sanctions that would permit the United States to create some kind of paths to get food, medical supplies, and I assume even to get the wounded and other people out of Syria in a better way. You seem to be really wanting America to take an active role in somehow saving Syrian casualties at this present time. And my question for you is, to what extent do you, would you encourage, if you were in the State Department and you had the president's ear, what kind of policy, what kind of literal action would you like the president to take? And when you urge this room to be involved, what would you want American Jewry to be doing now? Yeah. Look, my, my argument here is th there's a lot of bad things happening to a lot of bad people in the world. But Syria is um, the rare case of horrendous humanitarian concern that overlaps with vital U.S. strategic interests. If we're not active here, I don't know where we should be active. What can we do? I think that we should take a, um, a page from the, the president's own playbook. The president's argument is that the threat of military force compelled the Syrians to hand over their chemical weapons last autumn. My view is that um, uh, if it worked in last September, why shouldn't it work today? What we need in Syria on an urgent basis is access, roads, um, free access so that food and medical care um, can go in to uh, these besieged areas. It is not enough to provide tents and medicine and food when the refugees leave the country. We should be in there so they're not starving and dying in their own country. And so why don't we apply the exact same method that we did last September? Um, open up the roads to um, Red Cross and Red Crescent, otherwise we'll bomb them. Mm -hmm. It worked last September, the president said. Why shouldn't it work again? And you believe it did work? I want to take the president's word on this. Okay. And then you hear the argument, Robert, oh, but all you're doing is helping Al-Qaeda, which is ultimately anti-American, anti-West, and anti-Israel, and therefore you have two groups, both of which you don't want to aid. And what's your answer? Look, at first things first, the most important thing about the Syria conflict is to ensure that the Iranians, Hezbollah, and Assad don't win. Then we deal with the repercussions of the other side doing better. Um, if, if all we do is put up our hands in disgust because there's bad guys on every side, then that, I think, is an abdication of real responsibility. Would you say the same thing, by the way, about Ukraine? Do you want the United States involved in Ukraine? Um, you know, That's not the Middle East. Look, I got to say... <laughs> What, what, look, what, there's a few things that are important about the Ukraine. The Ukraine for, first reminds us that history is, still matters. Mm -hmm. It reminds us that uh, um, uncertainty reigns. It reminds us that tribal politics can operate still in Europe, so why should we be surprised for it operating in the Middle East? And it reminds us that we are still the, the nation to which the world turns to, uh, to, to repel aggression and to maintain the order.
And therefore, what do we do? And therefore, we need to put some substance behind uh, the president's and the secretary's warnings to um, the troublemakers in Syria and troublemakers in Ukraine. And we have to, at the very least, ensure that, um, that there's a significant cost to the Russians and that the NATO alliance, that the line of the NATO alliance remains absolutely positively firm, which means bolstering Poland and bolstering uh, the, the other nations um, in Eastern and Central Europe that are part of that alliance. All right, last question. I heard some awfully nice you things. You said three questions. This is the third question. Three areas, I said. So, um, and you always give me time. You're just wonderful. Thing. Listen, I heard some awfully nice things being said today from this panel about John Kerry and the peace negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and I don't get it. So I'm asking for help here. I say to myself, the Israelis have taken a constant position. I don't understand the extent to which, I say I don't understand, I don't know for sure how far Netanyahu is willing to go and what his coalition will permit him to do. But the state of Israel has basically said, we want a two-state solution. But it's a two-state solution with a side that's going to guarantee our security. And it seems to us that at the moment there is no Palestinian unified leadership that is willing to say what it needs to say about a Jewish state, ultimate security, a certain kind of guarantees in the Jordan Valley, giving up the right of return and making some meaningful compromise on Jerusalem. Do you see what I don't see? Do you see that there is a Palestinian leadership now that's willing to really accommodate the kind of suggestions and plan that Kerry and the Obama administration have put forth? Or do you understand why as I look at it, as so many people look at it, it's lovely, but it's going nowhere. Look, there's uh, obviously you, no one is going to go out of business by um, uh, an, by prophesying the demise of this um, of peace talks. I and mean, we're 20 some odd years running, and uh, the promise of Oslo is still unfulfilled. Um, uh, I think that there was. Um, uh, accolades for John Kerry because he has adopted a different approach um, to these negotiations than this administration has adopted previously. Articulate that because all I heard him do was threaten Israel. Well, if that's all you heard, then I think um, uh, either you didn't hear everything or he's not projecting or the administration. You're not very sweet. Accurate. What does he real? What's the difference? Well, the basic difference is um, in 2009, uh, the administration made uh, a, a suspension of all settlement activity the precondition for any any diplomacy. By the way, Kerry began with settlements also. Very differently. The whole point of this diplomacy was to solve the settlement issue through the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And Kerry came to Netanyahu and said, what do you need to make this framework agreement uh, acceptable? And he took the two major items, and others as well, but the two major items that Netanyahu identified, namely um, security arrangements, um, uh, open-ended or condition-based um, Israeli presence in the Jordan Valley, and um, recognition by the Palestinians of Israel as the nation-state of the Jewish people. He made these two, uh, uh, he, he, he set out his goal as to secure Palestinian acceptance of these two, which is a big deal. And he, not only with the Palestinians, he actually went to Riyadh to ask the king of Saudi Arabia whether he would bless the Palestinian acceptance of the Jewish state. I mean, you can imagine that conversation is not a usual one mm -hmm. for the custodian of the two holy mosques, right? Um, uh, and his basic approach is try to, pr to create an agreement that is built from Netanyahu's demands rather than American impositions. Now, there have been some false steps along the way. There have been things that should have been included that weren't included. Personally, I think the major um, uh, gap in our approach is failing to provide a set of costs for the Palestinians mm -hmm. in the event they opt out, in the event they say no. And without costs, we all act on gains and, and costs. And for the Israelis, the costs are real. For the Palestinians, it's very vague. Um, I think we need to do that. But I would say, in general, the Kerry approach has been extremely sympathetic to Israel's concerns. And the outcome, to the extent that I know even vaguely from press reports what's in this document, also is quite sympathetic to core Israeli concerns. And for that reason, I think the Israelis are going to accept with reservations, but they're going to accept. And you think the Palestinians will? Very, un uh, uh, very uncertain. This to me is the big question mark. A lot will depend on the president's meeting. 
um, will the president with with uh, sorry with the Palestinian leader exactly. on March 17th, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, will the United States walk back from some of the um, uh, ideas that we have offered which are sympathetic to Israel? Will the United States raise the cost of the Palestinians of saying no? I think these are two very big questions. And if the outcome is wrong on these, then Abu Mazen will probably walk. You seem to be saying that you're pleased with the direction that Kerry has taken, whether in essence he's successful or not, and that the credit he gets is for the tone and the way the peace process was designed, not necessarily that he will be successful. Look, you know, we'll find out. The uh, success is the ultimate uh, is the ultimate arbiter here. Um, so uh, I'm much, even, I'm much too pessimistic. I don't want to say too pessimistic. If you, you know, I'm a historian by training. If you want to look at it in historical terms, the chances for progress today are better today than at any point in the last decade, any point since the end of the Second Intifada. Does that mean it's going to happen? Absolutely not. Are the chances greater? Yes. Can there be a peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians if Hamas and Fatah remain separate? Look, this is a, uh, this is clearly a bridge that will have to be crossed um, if there is ever to be a final resolution here. Um, Moshe Dayan, well, Eli Rubinstein, Israeli Supreme Court Justice, used to quote Moshe Dayan on questions like this, and he used to say, "We'll double cross that bridge when we come to it." You are terrific, Robert Satloff. Really terrific, okay. and you, you did a much. great job here, Robert <laughs> Satloff. Say hello to Shalom TV. Hello, Shalom TV. I love what you do. I'm here with Amos Harel, senior defense analyst for Haaretz newspaper in Israel. Amos, it's uh, such an honor to have you here with us. And I wanted to um, ask you a question. You know, in the Middle East, I think the issue of religion is a bit taboo. And um, one of the conversations that came up right now was the notion that Pres uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is requiring that the Palestinians accept Israel as a Jewish state as a prerequisite for peace talks. I was just wondering, is he shifting the conversation by bringing in that, that Jewish peace? There is a, a slight shift, but it's not so recent. It has been uh, brought about uh, th that issue uh, years ago, even by Tsipi Livni when she was handling negotiations for the Olmert government. And Netanyahu more or less fell in love with that notion uh, recently, and it has been a demand. But we, we are seeing that the Obama administration is actually quite understanding regarding this demand. And perhaps for the first time, it will, I'm not sure it will be accepted, but there will be some progress on this issue, which Israel uh, didn't so much emphasize years ago. What do you think that signifies if the Palestinians indeed accept Israel as a Jewish state? We'll, we'll, we'll believe that when we'll see it. I don't think it's that, it's that immediate. But uh, it, for Israel, it does signify end of uh, conflict and end of cl uh, claims. If there, that's the ideological background for so, at least some of the Palestinian resistance to the whole idea of the state of Israel. And once this uh, bridge is crossed, this is perhaps another important step in the right direction. But we're not there yet. I would agree. And so in speaking about the Obama administration, a lot of what we've been hearing is about um, whether President Obama has been supportive of Israel enough in terms of Iran and sanctions. Can you speak to us a little bit about where Israel stands on that? It's complicated. Looking back, Israel has been uh, critical of, of Obama's uh, positions ever since he has been elected. And you know that the chemistry between the two leaders was not too good, to say the least. But having said that, it was that president who actually brought about the sanctions. Uh, if you compare that to what was done during the Bush administration uh, years, then it was President Obama, for whatever reasons, perhaps it was because of the Israeli um, military threat that was building, perhaps it was because the, uh, of Netanyahu's positions, but he did push forward the sanctions. He did um, increase a pressure on the Iranian economy, economy, which was hurt badly. And this, in the end, led to both to uh, Rouhani's, um, to the fact that he was elected to president and to the fact that he showed a new face of Iran in the recent negotiations in uh, Geneva. So that was uh, quite a success that both Netanyahu and Obama could claim uh, credit for. The problem is that after that, and following uh, the administration's uh, positions regarding uh, the Syrian conflict, uh, for instance, Israel has enough uh, room for uh, skepticism, if I'd uh, phrase it that way. Uh, we are not sure that uh, the administration is willing to go all the way, that it will, in case this is necessary, pull every uh, string that is needed 
to uh, pressure uh, Iran, including threatening Iran with the military strike, because it, by now it's rather evident that neither the Obama administration or the American public are too keen uh, for such a situation to materialize. Amos, you know, part of what I'm wondering uh, if we're witnessing today is, is a resurgence of Soviet power because of, of this reluctance that you just mentioned. I mean, so if you put that in perspective with Iran, Syria, and now Ukraine, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think that uh, Russia became, in the recent years, again, a, a player in the Middle East. It's not the same kind of world that we had in the Cold War, where you had two superpowers competing for areas in which they uh, ruled. It, it's not the same case, and Russia is not as strong as the Soviet Union was in the 60s or the 70s. But it's rather evident that President Putin is more and more interested in calling the shots in, in, in certain areas of the world. Ukraine is the, the latest example, of course, much closer to the, Russian, to the Russian border. In Syria, he has been very, very influential. I don't think that uh, President Assad would have survived without all the military assistance and, and, and financial assistance from uh, Moscow. This has been very, very important, and it played a negative role, if you'd like, regarding the, the, the Syrian civil war. Given that we are in a post-Cold War era and that uh, Russia is not as strong as the Soviet mm -hmm. Union used to be, but if we do start to see a shift, I mean, I really can't help but wonder if we're seeing a shift right now as we speak, mm -hmm. how do you think increasing Russian power and leverage in the Middle East would play out for Israel? relationship between Israel and Russia is much better than it was with uh, Moscow under the Soviet Union in the 60s or 70s. Uh, between 67 and 73, the, by, by, by the end of that period, there were no uh, diplomatic relationship between uh, Jerusalem and Moscow. Uh, this is not the case right now. Netanyahu has visited Moscow. Putin has visited Israel. There's quite... Um, a relationship there. We have an embassy, of course, in Moscow. But still, I mean, Israel could not be too interested in the growing uh, influence of the, the Russians. And, and the Russians have not been a good um, influence on uh, Damascus, except for one issue, which is the dismantling of the chemical weapons stockpiles, which were only reached after American pressure. You can't say that the Russians were a positive influ influence over Assad. So I, I just want to bring the conversation back to um, APAC and mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., and for, for the uh, Shalom TV mm -hmm. audience, the domestic agenda. Um, what do you think the American Jewish community can expect in terms of what Israel would like to see us doing in the coming year? I think more than anything else, Israel would like to see involvement by, by American Jews in, in what's going on, by uh, visits, by uh, political support, by coming out and, and, and supporting Israel in an environment, especially in the universities, in the campuses, that hasn't been so um, positive from an Israeli perspective in, the, in recent years. I think this is about involvement more than anything else. I wouldn't, as an Israeli, I wouldn't put myself in a position of telling you what to think or what to, or what to do politically. But the, the actual uh, support for AIPAC, the involvement in that is, is of course, important. Fabulous. So I think everyone who's here, 14,000 people are here at APAC. So quite I think numbers, yeah. quite some numbers in terms of involvement. So Amos Harel, it's really been an honor. And thank My you pleasure. so much for joining us on Shalom TV. My pleasure. So at the APAC conference here 2014, I have the great pleasure of standing with somebody you know very well, seen many times in many, many circumstances, but also on Shalom TV. Rabbi David Walpi, Los Angeles Temple Sinai, yes? Yes, Sinai okay. Temple. Sinai Temple. Um, first of all, what's your general sense of APEC so far this year? I mean, any place where you gather 14, 15,000 people in support of Israel in one place, that is, you know, Fabulous, just, right? yes, prima facie, that's an amazing <laughs> place to be. Um, and I think that it's, you know, one of the things that they do very well is they get young people, they get high school students, they get college students. Um, I brought more than a couple hundred. I didn't bring, but my synagogue brought more than a couple hundred really? people. Really? We do each year. And so for us, it's a fabulous experience. You also get to see people that you don't get to see all the time. <laughs> They're very so, good. It's lovely. Um, I want to ask you to comment on the two sure. main issues that we've heard okay. discussed here. One is... Iran and trying to do everything we can to keep Iran from going nuclear, and then also the peace process. Take them one at a time. In terms of what you've heard, are you personally comforted that John Kerry, the United States, the American administration, has done the right things to s uh, slow down and maybe even stop the uh, Iran's nuclear program? Do you worry in some way we've been sort of duped by the Rouhani regime? Okay. Well. Everybody, I think everybody has to worry. 
that you've been duped. I mean, I think that it's impossible to look at this and not think so. And I think that the Iranians are smart enough to be playing a long game. And I'm afraid, you know, that we change administrations every few years and we, as a result, tend to play a short game. Um, this problem did not start with the Obama administration. It didn't start with the Bush administration. It's been a problem of long standing. And, uh, and we are late to addressing it. And so I think they're doing everything they believe that they can. My concern is that we're in a too little, too late situation. And, and I'm not sure that anybody, um, that there is a military solution or that people involved will have the stomach in the post-Iraq, Afghanistan era to take that, especially because Iran's a different country, and what happens the next day is terrifying. So basically, um, while I am of optimistic character in general, this problem I find very dispiriting, and I can only hope that people who know more about it than I do uh, are wiser in their estimations than I am. You're a rabbi of a major congregation in Los Angeles. We were with Ari Shavit today. Yes. And Ari, who's written this book, My Promised Land, right. and he speaks eloquently about the future of the state yes. of Israel. He has a concern that young American Jews under the age of 30 who do not relate to the Holocaust, right. who were born after the 67 war, do not relate to Israel in any way the way we who are older do. And that his concern is for the young people of America, American right. Jews, young American Jews, he's worried that somehow the occupation, the way in which Israel is being portrayed in the general media, their own idealism and their universality, right is getting in the way of a young American Jews having a positive view of Israel and he wants that changed. So my two questions for you are, number one, how much do you find that true in the young people you see? Now, right. a lot of them are in your synagogue. Yes. In some way, that's already right. self-selective. Right. But in general, what do you think about the young American Jew today? And number two, to the extent to which you are concerned, do you have any suggestion as to how the Jewish establishment, you know, Jewish right, adults right. like you and I, how do we affect this issue? So I have some concern about it, although I think it might be somewhat overstated. That is, I think there's a lot of passion for Judaism, for Jews, um, for Israel among young Jews. Um, having said that, though, one of the ways that you do that is by emphasizing and selling, which I don't think we do enough, um, the case for Israel as a beacon of LGBT rights, yeah. women's rights, I mean, minority rights. The fact that the president of Israel was sent to jail for mistreating a woman by an Arab judge, this is a remarkable thing, and I don't know how many people know that. And so I think that were Israel fully portrayed, it would be better, and also, obviously, not only going to Israel, but if people appreciated the, the kind of pressure. I mean, Americans are very fortunate in being insulated. We have Mexico on one side, Canada on the other, and two seas. But if we had, you know, Iran in Texas, I think we would much more deeply appreciate the essential humanity of Israel's society and the restraint that it has shown for all the many mistakes and brutalities that have dotted and, and, and besmirched the record along the way, people would understand it differently. And so I think as those young people get older and they appreciate more the complexities of life and its difficulties and obstacles, they will also appreciate Israel more. That at least is my hope. I love spending time with you. Thank you. Koldova has like a wonderful work. David Wolfe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.